This week, the UK government debates adopting the net zero carbon by 2050 target, put forward by the Committee on Climate Change's recent report. To mark the occasion, we dive deep into the CCC's technical report to look at what it says should happen on transport, as well as who's criticising it and why. My name's Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. A little while ago, I did one of these looking at the proposals for electricity generation. We saw how big the challenge was, why the solution involved nuclear power or alongside major increases in renewables, and why the deadline would be hard to move forward earlier than 2050. But one of the policy areas people are always most interested in is that of transport. And that's not really because people have a fascination about talk of alternative fuels or nationwide provision of electric charging infrastructure. It's probably because in traditional environmentalist narrative, this is the area in recent years alongside that of food where traditional prescriptions go towards voluntary abstinence and lifestyle adjustment. You'll recall that I've been critical of traditional environmentalism in the past because it tends to go first and by preference to solutions that are the hardest to sell to the population. And this is where it really kicks in. And don't imagine that now in the era of electric cars that has changed in any way, but we'll come back to that later. Let's first of all take a look at the current situation. Greenhouse gas emissions from surface transport accounts for 23% of UK emissions in 2017. This comes from cars, vans and heavy goods vehicles, HGVs. According to the current government commitments, cars and vans can switch, cost-effectively, to electrical vehicles representing 100% of new sales by 2040. Buses can switch to electricity and hydrogen. Demand for transport can be reduced by encouraging walking, cycling and use of public transport and supporting freight operators to make improvements in logistics. These changes could reduce emissions by 79% by 2050. Now, the latest report that looked at going further to net zero identified what had to be done to make that extra step. Specifically, it proposes the following. One, bringing forward the end of sales of standard petrol and hybrid vehicles by five years to 2035, banning the use of petrol cars by 2050, transitioning HGVs to electric and hydrogen throughout the 2030s, a more ambitious programme of rail electrification and a rollout of hydrogen powered trains, and five more ambitious targets for demand reductions for through walking, cycling and public transport, aiming to reduce car mileage by 10%. Combined, those aim to reduce emissions by 98%. Is it going to cost a fortune? The committee believes that the electrification of cars, vans and motorbikes are cost-saving and will bring additional cost benefits because of a major improvement in air quality and the knock-on of health impacts. Now, improvements in areas such as rail electrification and other infrastructure aspects are where there would be additional costs to offset against that cost saving. It's worth noting that although we now see electric vehicles as a thing, just how far we actually have to go from today onwards. In 2017, just 0.3% of car and van miles were with electric vehicles. In 2018, electric vehicles were less than 2.5% of new car sales, and that was 22% up on 2017, but still from a very low base. Of course, the government can't just say it must happen and lo and behold, it happens. Currently, vehicle manufacturers are not producing enough electric vehicles to meet demand, which leads to long waiting times for vehicles. The committee says that to combat that, there need to be stronger policy incentives to provide industry with certainty to transition to zero emissions vehicles. Manufacturers need time to adjust to different skills and supply chains required. Key raw material inputs for lithium-ion batteries, lithium, graphite, cobalt and nickel, all of which will be required in greater quantities in the future. So supply of raw materials for lithium batteries could act as a bottleneck for electric vehicle rollout. Such concerns could potentially be mitigated by diversifying supply, advances in battery technology and recycling. With cobalt in particular, there are ethical issues around mining practices, as over half of the global supply comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Overall, in spite of the challenges, the CCC believes that the availability of critical metals and rare earth minerals should not constrain the supply of EVs. Not everyone agrees with them, as we'll see in a moment. One of the main challenges in the growth of electric cars is persuading customers to buy them. 
Now, that's not an issue here where there's currently a bottleneck, but we know that the barriers to adoption include currently higher upfront costs, even though the lifetime cost is comparable, but also what's been described as range anxiety, which is when you're worried that you'll run out of power before you get to a charging point. The costs of owning an electric vehicle are expected to reach cost parity in the 2020s. As always, when the volume of vehicles manufactured goes up, the cost will come down and it should become a cheaper option before 2030. The majority of daily driving can be done with vehicles of 50 miles range. But of course, it's not the short journeys that causes the anxiety. Researchers suggested that a range of 230 miles would tackle the issue of anxiety completely and it's expected that vehicle ranges will reach 190 miles by 2030. While it's relatively easy to electrify cars, vans and motorbikes, HGVs are another matter. A review of the cost of implementing zero emission HGV fuel and infrastructure points to hydrogen as the least costly. The net zero targets imply a rollout of hydrogen to reach nearly 100% of sales in 2040. Here's a timeline showing the CCC's view of how all of this would proceed. Now, the part I find least convincing is a bit about reducing demand by promoting public transport, walking and cycling, which is the part of the report that accords with the traditional environmental obsessions about changing personal behaviour. I don't find it unconvincing because I think promoting public transport is bad, per se. It's just there's no detail in the technical report about how this would be achieved. And the history of governments encouraging people to change their behaviours is a pretty poor one at best. So I'm wondering what they think they can do that will actually make a substantial impact in day-to-day behaviours. I wonder if it's in the report just because the absence would have so annoyed the standard environmentalists too much, so they thought they'd better throw it in just so that they could point to it and say that it's there. Now, there has been some kickback. The head of Earth Sciences for the Natural History Museum, Professor Richard Harrington, and others delivered a letter to the CCC pushing back against electric vehicles' expansion. The letter said that in order to meet its targets, we would need to produce just under two times the current total annual world cobalt production, nearly the entire world production of neodymium, and three quarters of the world's lithium production, as well as at least half of the world's copper production. Now, those figures sound extraordinary, but it's worth pausing to notice that they're taking the minerals demand for a 30-year project and comparing them to one year's global production. So yes, it's pointing out that there is a significant demand involved. It's not quite as disproportionate as it sounds at first take. And it didn't seem to be the case that the scientists thought that the basic project was wrong or that these challenges couldn't be addressed. They went on to say, over the next few decades, global supply of raw materials must drastically change to accommodate not just the UK's transformation to a low carbon economy, but the whole world's. Society needs to understand that there is a raw material cost of going green and that both new research and investment is urgently needed for us to evaluate new ways to source these. Some people saw the article and just used it to push their own perspective. For instance, this tweet from Green MEP Molly Scott Cato. Our love affair with a car has no future, she says. For the UK's 31 million cars to become electric, we would need huge and unsustainable amounts of cobalt, lithium and copper. Massive boosts for public transport and active travel, plus shared cars are the only way forward. Well, no. Actually, that would fail to deliver the near zero emissions scenario at all. Just like the environmentalist refusal to contemplate nuclear power as part of the baseload energy mix, which won't deliver a workable energy supply solution. The Committee on Climate Change proposals, while I have no doubt that they are not the only possible workable solution, are nevertheless practical and non-ideological reviews of what society could realistically do to deliver the end goal. None of the more ideological actors in this debate have so far come even close to something that addresses the realities. At least if they have, I haven't seen it yet. Now, the other part of transport that is a separate section all of its own, of course, is aviation and shipping. Shipping is relatively straightforward. With move to alternative fuels such as ammonia and other adaptations, it's thought that emissions there can be reduced to near zero. Aviation is the most difficult technical challenge of all. Without highly energy-dense fuel, it's hard to get anything other than the lightest of light aircraft to function on any kind of sensible commercial basis. 
there have been fuel efficiency improvements. That's reflected by the fact that although air travel emissions have doubled since 1990, the number of flight miles travelled has tripled. With the existing and reliably predictable technology, the CCC says that we can aim to stabilise emissions at 2005 levels, which is double the 1990 levels. This involves further fuel efficiency improvements and some limiting of demand growth to 60% above 2005 levels. The future promise for a real breakthrough probably comes from the development of synthetic fuels to replace jet fuels. The whole thing is complicated by the international nature of air travel, and so tracking whose emissions belong to whom easily becomes political and up for dispute. The real challenge the UK Parliament will face early on will be the one of Heathrow expansion. If you're going to constrain to some extent the growth of air travel, one of the obvious ways to do that would be not increasing capacity above what you've already got. But of course, there are all sorts of political costs associated with that decision. And it's one that groups like Extinction Rebellion are keen to cast a light on, with its recent mutterings about flying drones over Heathrow to shut the airport down. Although I would be surprised if they went ahead with that particular threat. The point is that within a balanced net zero approach to carbon emissions, the CCC has decided that in the medium term, the high cost of flying is something we need to carry because of the huge benefits that travel offers and that the population generally will give up those benefits extremely reluctantly. If it constrains demand, it has mentioned that there might be financial instrument taxes to you and me targeted at frequent flyers because they don't want to penalise the hard-working family taking the well-deserved holiday break that everyone speaks of. The hope is that carbon capture and removal technology elsewhere will eventually be able to offset the cost of air travel emissions to get to overall net zero. Needless to say, classic environmentalists will be driven to apoplectic fury by such a device. Extremist environmentalists have started talking about people taking, quote, genocidal holiday flights. And as always, it's a game of moral absolutism with ordinary people going about their business bearing the brunt of the disapproval. If I had to cast bets as to which approach would be most likely to deliver a sustainable future worth living in, I know which one I would go for. But that's just me. Let me know what you think in the comments below.